So <coughs> we are constructing this strange set, which is called the Cantor set, and uh, okay. So we can we so we were working about this Cantor Vitali. Which is a uh, phi, it's a function from 0, 1 to 0, 1 on to 0, 1. It is increasing continuous. And what we can say, okay, we can, we can give the correct definition later. Okay, the derivative of this guy is 0. So it's differentiable almost everywhere. Actually, differential in all these, uh, in the open set that has measure one, and the derivative is zero. So phi prime is equal to zero, so it exists uh, almost everywhere. So, however, so that's why it's, uh, it's called the daily step case because uh, you don't have any, say, any slope, but actually you have, and it is in a set of measure zero. So if you remember the construction was uh, as follows. So it's uh, the construction of all this uh, Cantor-like set, this fractal set, is done by I, I assign a family of transformation and then you rescale them and apply to smaller and smaller pieces until you get one. Well, you prove that what is left is some compact set that converges. And or in this case, you prove that, that it's a family of continuous functions which converge uniformly. So the limit exists because of compactness properties, but, has, but it has all these strange properties that they come from, from the, the, the procedure. So in this case, these are the same. So the thing was, so let's start with the, the initial Function, which is the identity, and what we do is the transformation is if we have, a, let's say, in A, B, A, B, we have a function which is a straight line, or whatever, that, well, we replace with, uh, you divide in three parts, and here you divide in two parts, and then it's uh, growing to half the interval in the first third constant and then ending up to the last point. Okay, so now we apply the transformation, this uh, initial data, and okay, and you divide one third, and this is the first iteration. Okay, you can reapply the thing here, but nothing happened. So actually what, ha what changes is just here. So and you see that the function becomes steeper and steeper, no? So that's why the derivative is going to concentrate. We will give the correct definition later, but it's going to concentrate into the complement of this open set. And now what we do, we compute, we compute the length of this open set. So, we have uh, so one lemma is that uh, the open set O, where let's say phi prime is equal to zero. Uh, I say it this way, no? But actually, remember, was uh, the complement, well, was the union of all these open intervals I'm going to remove, or where the function is constant from that uh, iteration onward, as measure one. The back measure one, no? And the proof that it's easy because uh, it's the union of, uh, well, okay, it's one third, the third union, and then we have the second iteration, so it's one nine, two nine, union, seven nine, eight nine, and then okay, the third iteration, well, you have four sets, and it's one twenty seven. Um, 227 
and then uh, okay, I start with uh, one th the the sorry, so from two nine I have to add the one twenty seven, and so it's a seven nine. A seven twenty seven. 27 and then okay so here I add 127 to one third so it's uh, 10 27 11 27 and then the last one is uh, 20 C 25 27 and uh, 26 27 and then okay we can go on to compute it it's not important the important thing is that uh, I, every time I add 2 to the i set, so the measure of O is the sum, let's say, I, uh, let's say uh, from i equal to 0 to plus infinity. So I, the first iteration is 1 third, and then I add 2 to the i set whose length is 3 to the i plus 1, so 3 to the i. And then okay, if you apply the formula, this gets exactly 1. Okay, so this is the... Uh, I have a question uh, about uh, this writing, phi prime of 0, phi prime is 0 almost everywhere. Uh, do, does we understand, should us understand it as uh, we can, uh, the, the set of all the elements where phi is derivable, uh, where phi is differentiable and uh, the derivative is zero, uh, is measurable and uh, the complement is zero, or yeah. shall we, or, or shall we, <coughs> shall we understand it as we can found one set uh, such that for each element of the set, uh, uh, the function is uh, differentiable and, the, de uh, and the, the derivative is zero. And the set is measured one. Yes. Okay, which is a little bit stricter. But actually both are correct here. It's not differentiable in the compact set. And is differentiable exactly in the open set. So in, that, in this case, yes, they, they think inside. So from a general point of view, so that this that you can always compute the derivative. If it exists, you give a value. If it does not exist, that you don't say anything, or you give, a, for example, plus infinity. Infinity doesn't matter. So this function is will be le measurable, and so the set where the derivative is finite is measurable. Existence is finite is measurable, and uh, so the difference between what you said. Here to what is the, the two your two definition is just a set of measures, and in this case actually it turns out that it, well this is a very nice function at the end compared to what you have here, and uh, the fact is that really in the open set you have the derivative the classical derivative it is zero but it is constant, and in the other set it cannot it is plus infinity if you do the limit as you see from the construction. No? You take any point of the rest compact set, well, you have that the, the, the slope will grow and grow. So if you do the limit, it can only be infinity. But OK, the, the, yeah, I, I, is the, in this case, it's really the strongest. <laughs> OK, so now, uh, well, the complement of this set is the Cantor set. Complement of O here is the Cantor set. Okay, and then I have to remember one thing. So, because there are many Cantor sets, fractal sets are often Cantor sets. So, here I want to remember that it's done by the procedure of dividing by one third. So, usually you call it one third Cantor set. some properties. Uh, okay, maybe uh, let's keep the draw properties. 
the image of k is equal to 0, 1. Of course, there was another problem, which is trivial, no? So let's say trivial. The measure of k is equal to 0. <laughs> and another one, k is compact. So the complement in 0, 1. We, we OK, the, the, the other parts are just, uh, you, they don't exist for us. So compact and measure zero is trivial, no? Because uh, where compact is the complement and uh, being a measure you can, so it's additive, so zero. However, the image of the set has full mesh, so it's an interval. In any, the important thing from our point of view is that it has measure one. Okay. Should I prove it? Do you believe it? You believe? You, you know how to prove it? So, or should I? Should I? You believe it, you know how to prove it. <coughs> Let's think a little, a little bit. K, let me say, K is a difficult object to treat. It's much better to treat the O, the open set. Indeed, open sets are generally nicer than closed sets. Because open sets, they always have this uh, countable union of interval structure. And so you're pretty fine because the measure, the countable union for the measure is just uh, the sum. And so you treat the first O. So, what is the image of O? So let's do the proof of this guy here. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I cancelled the lemma. The lemma is just uh, that as measure one. Okay. Today you have the tutorial. I gave him uh, some exercise for you. So, what is the image of proof? of phi of k is equal to 0, 1. So let's consider phi of O. This is what? You see it. Well, you can write it, you know? So, well, O is a countable union of intervals where the function is constant. So it's a union of countable many points. Yeah. So it's 2 to the minus i. 2 to the, sorry, 2 to the minus 1 union where we have 1, okay, 1, 4, 3, 4. And then union of the third iteration is 1, 8, 3, 8, 5, 8. And uh, 7, 8, union, okay, every time 1, 16, 3, 16, all the odd numbers divided by 2 to the minus i up to 1. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, 5 of O is countable. Okay. So, 5 of k. So certainly, certainly contains what? Contains the interval minus the image of O. Because uh, we know that the image is 0, 1. And clearly all the other points should be covered by the image of K. So in particular, what I use here is that it is dense. Now what I use? K is a compact. Phi is continuous. The image of a compact set is yeah. compact. Then it's the dense concept. Yeah. It's compact. And then I conclude with both of them. Then 
phi of k is equal to 0. Okay, now I say a sentence which, uh, well, it took me a while to understand, but actually it's uh, the true part. So the, the continuous function, they don't see measures, so the measure or set of measures 0 can become as large as they want, you want, and they don't see even dimensions. You know that there exists an example of a function from 0, 1, which his range is uh, the 0, 2, the square 0, 1 squared into R2, no? So they don't see either dimension and they even don't see measures. So corollary, the cardinality of K is equal to the continuous cardinality, the cardinality of R. Okay? This is just uh, really a corollary, no? Because if the image of a set is a uh, well, by definition of cardinality, no? A set has cardinality less or equal than the other if uh, there exists a function which maps the other. Function which maps the other into that set. <coughs> okay, there is only one problem here. So now le let me tell you what I want to do. So I want to show that uh, essentially uh, Borel sets and measurable sets, they are two different things. Not only from the point of view of the sigma algebra, but even from the point of view of measures. So I have to really be careful. I, it's very, I'm fine working with Borel sets, and I, I have to be careful with Lebesgue measurable sets. Because you have uh, these non-measurable sets, which uh, they can, well, non-Borel sets, which can be mapped into K. So we know that any subset of K is measurable, because K has measure 0, no? But since phi maps K into an interval, it could happen that a set of measure 0, which is measurable, is mapped into a set which is non-measurable. And this is what we want to do. So I want to show that uh, if, a, if I have a Borel set instead, it happens that the image of phi K will be Actually, it would be boring in this particular case. But uh, for measurable set, I should be really, I should be careful. So there is one problem here, and is the fact that uh, to do to build the inverse because uh, I would like to use the inverse function. No, I, I, I would like the function to be one to one. In that case, there is no problem. I can the inverse is continuous, and uh, it's much nicer to work with that function. Otherwise, I have always to remember that I have these intervals, and actually, I, I don't know what happened here. It's a little bit tricky. So what I do is that I change a little bit the function in order to be strictly increasing. In that case, the inverse exists, and since the function is continuous, the inverse is continuous. OK. Um, so now. I have a question yeah. before we uh, where have we used uh, the fact that uh, phi prime is zero almost everywhere? No, this is just a property. Uh -huh. Just a strange property I give you. Later we will see that this is important. This is uh, one of the characteristics. I mean, you have a class of functions where when this happens, the function is constant. But we have immediately an example that this, you cannot say for any continuous function, if the derivative is zero almost everywhere, the function is constant. No, no, this is strange. You have to think it's strange. If I have a C1 function, the fun derivative is equal to zero, means the function is constant. But immediately we say that we cannot uh, relax this far. So you think as follows. So before uh, all the definitions are given pointless. So the continuity is pointless. The derivative differentiability is pointless. So what we, the, one of the main, uh, let's say, uh, important thing about measure theory is that we replace everywhere with almost everywhere. So you state properties in sets of up to a negligible set. But here we see that you have to be careful. So saying that the derivative zero almost everywhere does not imply that the function is constant. So every time you, well, the measure theory is powerful, but you have to be careful, of course, as usual. So, 
Unfortunately, I have to change, to cancel this. And then we do the, our new function psi. Define psi is x, so psi of x plus phi of x. Okay. So what happened is now these are straight lines. Okay, they arrive to two, uh, yeah, and then it's here. One. And okay, the cantor set lives uh, inside this uh, part. So instead of having flat parts, I have uh, uh, well, yeah, I then affine segments. Yeah. Okay, and now the properties, which I deduce from uh, the properties of phi. Okay, is a uh, psi is strictly increasing. Increasing. Yeah. Yeah. But the, 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 this is not these are not required the derivative. No, no, it's that only homeomorphism. Yeah, yeah, it's but let's start with strictly increasing. Well, strictly increasing and continuous, then okay, it's homeomorphism. Strictly increasing because psi of if x less than x prime. Do you agree? I don't need the derivative, you know, to say that it's strictly increasing. Do you agree? Yeah, because phi is increasing, and this guy clearly is strictly increasing. Psi is continuous. Do you agree? We have some of the continuous functions continuous. Psi of maps 0, 1 onto 0, 2. But being continuous, the image is connected. Okay. So I deduce, as I said, that corollary psi is a homeomorphism from 0, 1 into 0, 1 to 0. Okay. And now I'm trying to find. Because now I don't have the trouble to say that the counter image of a point is a point. Now the, each point is mapped to one point and vice versa. So that is, uh, this thing here said that phi of k now, well, is the union of what? Psi of k. Is compact. What is the nature? It's compact, no problem. K is compact, plus is continuous. What is the measure? Always look at to the, to the complement, the image of the complement. Yeah, yeah, it's true. This is the image of all. Yeah. The image of the complement as we will have length 1, and so this is length 1. And the measure of psi of k is equal to 1. Why? Do you need to prove it? Please say no, uh, no I don't see why. Okay, proof. I leave to, for an exercise, I want to try. Proof? Psi of O as measure one, and just a look at what what, uh, what I'm doing. So the O is a union of these uh, open intervals. The image of these open intervals under psi is an interval translated, but uh, with the same length. You can even write exactly what is the formula, but it's not important. Important thing here is that there's the same length. So the that this guy is an open set because it is a homeomorphism whose length is 1, whose measure is 1. And so the opposite is a closed set whose measure is 1. And 
Now let's do something even more strange. The interior of K let's say lemma the psi of K interior is M. You see, well, I'll several proofs, but let's do one. Say it's an homeomorphism. Yeah, this is this. So, because if uh, there exists an open set in the image of K, there should be an open set into K. But K has major zero. If E is contained in Psi of K, then Psi is a homeomorphism. There exists I prime interval contained in K, which is uh, impossible. Because the measure of K is equal to zero. So you see, now we have really some, a strange set, so the image of this uh, uh, K is another compact set whose measure is one, nowhere dense. And uh, um, okay, later maybe we see a little bit of category theory. So now uh, we need another lemma. Is it? And uh, mm, so, before the do, why this lemma is important, uh, I prefer uh, to switch a little bit about uh, how we do the integral now. We will see the integral later, but otherwise, we just take the lemma and you don't understand why it's so important. So, how we will compute the integral of a function now? And this is just a let me say a remark. It's a jump in the, the future. It is how to compute integral. So let me put here the rima. Essentially, what I do, I divide it into slices, and essentially, what I, well, I replace with some approximation. It's not important now how to, to uh, I construct the approximation. And now, let me put here the back. With the same function, almost. I divide into the vertical and uh, I add up uh, these pieces. You understand the pictures or? Uh for you to think a little bit. You see that there is really a switch on the way I look at the, the, the area of a set. Well, it's not important if you clearly imagine that this guy is, uh, I don't know. So if we have something like this one, then the two, the two things are the same, no? We just exchange. But for a general function, really a different, is a different uh, thing. Because essentially here I'm using that the ordering in R to make a partition. Here I don't care what is uh, the domain set. But I just get that the range is R. And then what I do, I say, well, OK, you slice it vertically and then approximate with some function, some piecewise, uh, some simple function is called. 
And what I say, the integral is the limit of these approximations. So what is the important thing that I have from here and from there? There is a, a subtle difference. So when I compute the Riemann, you see, I give the value. So the, the, some value here is essentially the value of the f in some point. And then uh, the fact that f is continuous, or this piecewise continuous, is the condition that implies that the Riemann sums converge. OK? So you see, I, give, I can always give some Riemann sum. But then the problem is the convergence. But here is actually. Free the, con the convergence is free in some sense because uh, you see, if I slice inside epsilon, so the difference is at most epsilon times the length of this guy. So the convergence is automatic, but there is one issue, of course, you cannot integrate everything. And is that when I compute the, the integral of the simple approximation, I need to require that. So let's consider, for example, this approximation. This set should be measurable. No? So you see, the, the, the switch is that uh, here I have uh, the problem in the convergence. Here my problem is really at the beginning. I can do the approximation, but if I want to compute the integral of the approximation, which is a final sum, I need to require measurability. Measurability of what? OK, essentially, what you do is, for example, you say, well, the set where this uh, simple function is defined is the set where f, so I need f larger than a is measurable. Uh, oh, sorry, I, is the, I told you about the notation. I'm sorry. I told you that. Sure, to told you. <laughs> Because if I have this property, then essentially you say that, OK, you can say the simple function is just uh, the function where it is larger than some, some value, and I can integrate. So it's this size epsilon times this length. We will see later, in the, I, I hope today to start, but uh, I prefer to, that you understand why the theory works in one direction, or moves in one direction. This is really one direction. So this is the other key point you have to remember. I, I, my opinion is that this picture is fundamental. You understand why they are so different, the two constructions. OK, so now we, we go a little bit farther. So this set is the inverse of an open set. Okay. So f to the minus 1 of open set is measurable. We will see it later. Let me go a little bit fast. But since this is a sigma algebra and uh, the, opera the set operations, they commute with inverse, so the intersection, the inverse of intersection is the intersection of the inverse, then essentially I can deduce that f to the minus 1 of the Borel set is measurable. OK, and this is the condition in order to compute the integral. The integral could be plus infinity or uh, well. But in any case, I can construct approximations. OK, so now I want to prove that at least continuous functions are measurable. The inverse of the Borel sigma algebra is measurable. In particular, I deduce that the inverse of Borel set is a Borel set. Well, actually, at the end of the day, Borel set for continuous function, for psi. And then I will do the following. I will prove that instead the inverse of measurable sets is not measurable in general. Okay? So let me recap the thing. You can forget this part. I don't suggest you to do so, but uh, we will really see, we will see later. At the end, one of the important conditions you need to have is that the inverse of open set is measurable. And this is equivalent to the inverse of Borel set is measurable. So this is the fundamental condition. 
the function will be considered from now, from the, the next lesson onward, a just function which satisfies even for today, satisfy that thing. The rest of the function is like the non-measurability sets, non-measurable set we have constructed. And the natural question is, can I replace here with n? And we will use psi to prove that is false. You cannot replace it. So that condition is sharp. Questions? Nothing that's in between? Hmm? We cannot find nothing in between? For particular f, no. In general, if you allow me to have a general f. OK, uh, let's say for f continuous, you can, there, is a, there are these in between sigma algebras, which is, for example, the sigma algebra of a, a projective set, the sigma algebra of universally measurable sets, or sets which are measurable for all the measures. But all these sets are, uh, um, you need additional uh, axioms. You cannot describe them. The only, there, is, there exists a, the, from the Borel set, you can still construct the projective sequence, but then it becomes a, immediately a complicated object. It's not so easy. So um, I would say that from our point of view, no, there is not any. That's the major But OK, if you, but there are books about this object, <laughs> really, which is called Borel sets. And they really describe uh, all this uh, in between uh, algebra from Borel set to the most large pro projective and then even more. Projective sets are very important, but uh, not from the point of view of the integral. At the, end, uh, at the end, the thing is, as I said before, if you don't use the axiom of choice, you can always work with this situation. OK, so now the goal, we have psi with this property that I can I, I maybe I cancel here, so we need this uh, lemma. But this is a really important proposition. If F is Borel, uh, sorry, I, I, uh, F is continuous, F from R to R. Then f to the minus one of Borel sets is Borel. So we have the continuous functions, they are certainly what is called here measurable. This definition of measurable, Lebesgue measurable function. Proof. There are two proofs. One is a constructive, and the other one is there. We do the direct one, which is the one in the book. But <laughs> The, the constructive one is, is nicer, but it, it's, it's longer. So the constructive one is because you can construct the Borel sets. But that is continuous, so it just we don't say that the inverse image of open sets is open? It's open, and then you deduce that the inverse image of this guy is a sigma algebra which yeah. contains the open sets. Yeah. And why is it coincide with the open set? Why? It coincides with the sigma algebra of open sets. How oh, is equal? Uh, so, uh, okay, okay. I, I, I think it's just to, because there we are writing just that it's in M. I yeah, that's true. You know that the sigma R, well, yes, it's yeah. in M, but actually. I want to prove that it's equal. It's equal, uh, yeah, yeah. So if we take uh, Boran set, then we can find a continuous function such that, uh, yeah. or I don't understand what you mean, what, what do you mean exactly with equality? With equality? It means mm -hmm. that for any Boran set, the, the, you have the we, can, family. We, we can find another one so that the inverse image by f is equal to this one. No, no. This means that uh, for any e Borel, yeah. there is no f minus one of e is Borel. Yeah, that's what I said. No, no. Oh, okay, okay. So there, it's not me because I, I don't see what the table. Is this inequality? And the statement says that, is, yes, is, is because the inverse of the sigma algebra means the union of all these inverse. Yeah. Sorry, the V is a problem in notation. This is f to the minus 1 of E 
e of L. And this is equal to B. So and this is equal to B. Yeah. The subset of equal. Yeah. It's equal. But what we write, what we write in here is that down is an inclusion on this, equivalent to this, equivalent to an inclusion. No, this is what I want to prove. Yeah, but this is the inclusion, not the equality. What you know is that certainly, well, that the trivial proof, which does not work, is that uh, f to the minus 1 of e, f of 1 of open sets is open. And then f minus 1 of a sigma algebra is a sigma algebra. And all together they say that f to the minus 1 of the Borel contains the Borel. Because it's a sigma algebra which contains the yeah. sets. Just the two lines. You, you, you just said that what we want to prove mm -hmm. is equivalent to the second line. That for all E and B, f minus 1. But it's not an equivalent. It's only an implication. This one? Yeah, this is not equivalent to the first. Because the, the, this one mm -hmm. implies only that f minus 1 of ah, B sorry. is equivalent yeah, yeah. No, I said something wrong. This contains. Yeah, okay. That's what it can be equal. It's constant. Yeah, yeah, also, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, because I write what I, what I think, what I, it's not what I think, but I write. <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah. Okay, so this done one. So the other proof is that I think I need for exercise, because there is really an exercise even in the book. So you prove that the family of E such that f to the minus 1 of e is Borel is a sigma algebra. Uh, and again, what you use is just that this property here. And now you know that the in continuous, this sigma algebra contains the open set. So it's a sigma algebra which contains the Borel sigma algebra. And in particular, then you have this inclusion because uh, in that case would be the equality. <laughs> so the, the equality holds for any function or no? The equality, which equality? This one, yes. I, I wrote something which is not, uh, not uh, it holds for homeomorphism. Yeah, homeomorphism. Yeah. Otherwise so, we can, well, even homomorphism. Yeah, otherwise we have. It's about subjectivity or not for? Or no, you, you need the injectivity and subjectivity. But well, injectivity may. Subjectivity is not it. Injectivity. Simply because if you have a function which is, con let me back here. That's nice. So take the constant function. What is the inverse of uh, the Lebesgue? Uh, or empty. It's only, exactly, it's only empty if you take a cell here or the whole R, if you take a set which contains the point. So the inverse of the Borel set is just the, the easiest sigma algebra you can imagine. The empty set of the whole set, and it's home. Okay, if it is a homomorphism, or if it is just a, let's say, one injective, it's just injective, then even one interval can be mapped into the whole R. Okay, this was the I'm sorry, I, I really write and then it's not what I, what I have in mind. I mean, and then also what they say is not what I have in mind. <laughs> okay, so far so good. So at the end we have this problem. Corollary, we apply to Psi. Uh, let me write here. Because unfortunately I need to keep those properties. Psi of Okay, here is injected, so it is equal to Borel. At least the one restricted to 0, 2, and also psi to the minus 1. But that consequence is not true either. Hmm? Why every open set is a pre-image of f? If, if it is, uh, uh, you, well, uh, this one, if this continuum is an open set. Yeah, but that continuum what says this part is that here that was not that huh? the, the part that is uh, that that contents to the right the inclusion this inclusion is supposed to be in this inclusion yeah. this inclusion 
Okay, so from this proposition, we have certainly that the image of the ball as here are more as said there, and vice versa. The question now is uh, can I replace this guy with M? Okay, let me use the drawing, the drawing here. So here we have a set of positive measure. which is psi, let's say, A e psi of this counter set, whose length is 1. Now we know how to build non-measurable sets. So we can take non-measurable set into 0, 2, and then just uh, intersect with this 1. So there exists, so let's put it, this is an example. Let I can cast this guy. A equal to psi of k and B contained in A B not in and we know it exists. I mean if you give me the action of choice, otherwise I cannot I cannot answer the question. Now, can you finish the thing? So the thing is that I want to find a measurable set whose inverse is non-measurable. And uh, I can't say this, is that not needed now? Yes, uh, if we take B, the inverse image of B is a subset of K, then it is measurable because all uh, zero measure set is measurable. Yes. M star, let's say. Well, I don't know yet, but okay. This is M of K, which is equal to 0. And this implies B prime is measurable. This set, so I have another set here. And the inverse of this set is a set which stays in my strange looking counter set. So it has outer measure 0, hence it is measured. But actually it turns out that psi of B prime, which is equal, okay, because I want to use this formula, psi to the minus 1, to the minus 1 of B prime, <laughs> it's equal to B, which does not belong to M. So the corollary is that, or uh, there exist measurable sets, the bag measurable sets, and the continuous function, such that f to the continuous function f such that a measurable set, let's say, b for b, such that f to the minus 1 of b is not measurable. So this long discussion tells you that you have always be careful with measurable sets, because all the problems happen in sets of measure 0. And set of measure 0 can be mapped to set of positive measures, and then you are in trouble. For both sets, no. Okay. So this is the end essentially of the first chapter. Let me see if I... Okay, and... Uh, okay, let's do... I think I gave some examples, but uh, an important thing is uh, if I place, uh, there are some functions which are 
better than continuous, such that I can take m here. Let's, let's consider this question. Yes, because it is another important class of functions. So you know the definition of a Lipschitz function? You know the definition of Lipschitz? Lipschitz function. Lipschitz function is, so f is Lipschitz. And sometimes you specify okay, with constant L, L from Lipschitz, of course, if for all x, x prime, the distance of x minus x prime is less or equal than L, the original distance. So at most, you enlarge intervals by L. So questions. Is psi or phi Lipschitz? What do you think? Yeah, for the no, because, <laughs> <laughs> because when we take x prime very, very near close to s, f of x minus f of x prime will be very very large yeah, during so the construction. Can be Lipschitz. Lipschitz. Yeah. Or you have a set of method. No, because. of the following lemma. Let's, let's take the general lemma. For all E Borel, but let's say even measure. The measure of F of E is less or equal than L. The measure. So, and the lemma clearly, I always, I already said that this one is measurable, and the measure is. Yeah. So we suppose that e is k, and then we have something which is not zero, that's what it was. <laughs> okay, let's forget about the measure of unity so far, because okay, this takes, but the important because the measure of unity falls because. Uh, uh, you prove that set of measure zero or measure, uh, measure zero. And then for the rest, essentially, you are working with uh, G delta sets. And G delta or F of F sigma set. And certainly F being continuous, that's the easy part. So the, the, the key point, and it can be done as I said, the key point that I want to, to analyze with you is the fact that the length is controlled. In particular, it is as measure zero as measure zero. And once you know this fact, you know that you can replace m here because you know that the measure is present. So the, the, so the counter image of set of measure zero as measure zero it doesn't happen. The bad, the bad thing about psi, no? I have a question. <coughs> is it already the second chapter? Is it already? The second chapter, chapter two. Uh, this is a piece of an exercise. We start chapter two now, yeah. That which is chapter, I don't remember, it's, it's called three. The chapter one is just uh, the introduction. This is, uh, yeah, but, uh, but I, I try to I switch a little bit because uh, in my opinion, otherwise you just follow the theory and then you don't understand it. I, I prefer to switch a little bit to show why you are forced to do some steps. So, and, the important thing here is that this class is very important. And uh, we see just one uh, aspect of, the, of this class, and it is the fact that you have no trouble replacing B with M, because uh, the important relation is that the measure is controlled. And Psi is a, a continuous function for which you don't control the measure. Okay, you know how to prove it? We assume the measurability. I start with the suggestion. Let's do for one interval. So the measure of the f for one interval is less or equal than L 
the measure of the interval. Okay, from this one, you should be able to end it, no? To end the proof. Because now you cover this with, uh, you cover E with countably many intervals. You map them forward and they clearly cover F of E. And they are still interval because F is a continuous. Okay, so I give you a size to conclude. And so the, the, la the remark about this property is that the, let's say, strange property, I can say they are bad, strange properties of phi and psi cannot hold for Lipschitz function. So it's a nice class of function that you can use. Well, or the, you use it for once you know the function is Lipschitz, you have a lot of freedom. More freedom than just knowing it is continuous. Because they map a of set of measures zero into a set of positive measures. Or you do as a you plus my set. Well, you just look. But the, during the construction, we see that there are points which are arbitrarily far, even if they are arbitrarily close. So the constant L grows at the, every iteration. Okay, and then, uh, okay, the exercise the size we will do this after. I'm sorry. Uh, let me see. No, this stupid guy. Okay. So, this, then now we switch to the Lebesgue measurable function, which is already written here. Now we will see a little bit more uh, in details. So are there questions here? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> Who is the <laughs> uh, Is it possible to find many... Uh, we, we give just uh, one construction of uh, Lübeck uh, measure. Uh, is it possible to, to find uh, Different different measure which extend the the interval the, the measure of the interval. What, what do you mean different measures? Well, there are several different measures, but what you mm, on Borel set? Yes, you can find different measures, and what what you want to do? I mean, uh, uh, I ask if it is possible to to have a um, uh, measure defined on the Borel set uh, which extend the, the length of the interval. Uh, Extend in which sense? Uh, for example, the, the, the Lebesgue measure extends because it is defined on a larger set than the Borel set. Yeah, but the, the, the length of the intervals is the same. So the length of the, the, your new measure gives to the interval a value which is the length. Yes. Then it is the length. Also, okay, you can just make it rely on positive constant. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, well, all the long, but it is in code because it's fixed. The length of 0, 1 is 0, 1. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean that if, if we want that the, the measure of integrals is the length, then it's the Lubeck measure. Yeah. But if we forgot this condition, then we can define all Ah, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But uh, I will tell you that uh, what you have several measures, but if you fix uh, what is the value on the intervals, it's done. The measure is defined. Essentially, because uh, the Borel's is for all these measures, they have uh, they are measures on the Borel set plus set of measures zero. This happens for all. And if you define what is on intervals, you define what is on Borel set. On open set, then Borel, then it, uh, it's forced to be that that measure. Uh, yeah. Can you say that uh, this measure is unique? Yeah, yeah, it's unique. I mean, okay, the problem is the domain. Because you can say the Lebesgue measure is restricted to the Borel set or to the Lebesgue measurable set. But if you, on the la essentially, the measure is unique when you say it's defined for the largest class of sets, which is M. Yes, it's unique. So there is a theorem which states you that if the sigma algebra is generated by some 
like family of set, so it's the smallest seed module generated but containing that family. And if the, if your function is defined as some value in that set and can be extended to a measure, the measure is unique. There is only one extension. <coughs> so in this case, the open the value on open sets define what is the measure. So it's something like uh, you know that because uh, the sigma additivity can be seen as a continuity condition on uh, the algebra of sets. If you go really abstract, and what you are saying is that I have a function which is continuous and is defined in a dense, see, dense, dense family of points which are the open sets. Then there is only one extension. So this is if you go a little bit abstract. I mean. Okay, so now we do the, the very measurable function. So as I said, the important thing is that uh, I have, uh, instead of slicing vertically, I slice the function horizontally. And so what I have to require is that I'm able to measure level sets, or upper level sets. So, the most, in, well, there are several conditions, but let's see the stupid thing. So, proposition. Just to say that many, many definitions can be equivalent, so you don't care. Equiveridical. One f to the minus one of uh, c plus infinity is measured. F to the minus one c plus infinity closed is measured. F to the minus one. I, I all the condition you can imagine. L minus infinity to c is measurable, f to the minus 1 of minus infinity c closed is measurable, and okay, I can go on, no? I can take intersection, what doesn't matter. And then, okay, let's say 5, <laughs> f to the minus 1 of the Borel is measurable, is contained in i. This is now correct. <laughs> Corollary? F minus 1 of the level set is measured. Okay. Proof. Uh, you want to do it by the exercise or let's have some fun together or it is just that, that easy. You better than somebody is a little bit perplexed. Okay. Let, 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 I'm sure one. So let you know how to pass from this guy to this guy? Okay, control just... Uh, just hmm? Control intersection. Control intersection. So from 1 to 2. F minus 1 of C plus infinity is equal to F minus 1 of the intersection, let's say, C minus 2 to the minus i plus infinity. And now, okay, the set operation, they have no trouble. F minus 1, C minus 2 to the minus i plus infinity. And clearly, this belongs to M. And M is sigma algebra. M sigma algebra. And then you do the same. This is from this to this guy, for example, is the complement. Okay, this is the, this is the complement of this guy. And then, okay, from this to this guy is again the same operation. And this guy? Well, this guy was the proof we had before, no? That uh, the inverse of the sigma algebra is sigma algebra. And uh, from this guy, you know that the inverse of uh, this set and then the inverse of intersect is 2, for example, the inverse of open set is measurable. Okay? 
just to by exercise, just to you need to do these exercises really, because otherwise if you uh, if you don't do them, you don't 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 have the feeling what is going on. Corollary of this guy. Well, it's trivial because it's the intersection of these two. And now exercise. Exist F not satisfying the proposition such that F to the minus one of C is measurable. So the corollary is in the corollary, it's not inside the, the proposition. How to build this uh, f minus one? We consider the non-measurable set. Yeah. Not, not being here, you need to start with non-measurable set. So let's take the non-measurable set here. Then? The characteristic function of uh, this set. If I take one, then I get this set and it doesn't work. Uh, but this, and this is for all C or? For all C. Mm. You multiply by C times the characteristic. Yes. The constant. Yes. I mean. The, the, the identity. Huh? So it is the identity. So let's say F is equal to 0. OK, let's say minus X. That x belongs to does not belong to a and x if x belongs to a. Only oh, zero one, the rest you don't care. But the inverse of each point is just one point, a single point, is a single point. So it can be measured. But the inverse of the positive or the negative half line, they are a or the complement, which cannot be. Both you have to try it. I, I really, I really uh, want you to uh, to try to do this exercise. If it is, and then you this afternoon we have also the the, the guy because uh, for this theory uh, the main thing is to do this. But, well, at the end they become clear clear and simple exercise, but they are very form, fundamental, otherwise you never get the insight. And the proofs are never complicated, they are always based on these little tricks. Okay. And now after this definition we can say, after this proposition we give the definition. F as in the proposition, so one of these three property, properties, is called Lebesgue measure. The Lebesgue refers to this M. If I ask, I could do the same, because everything here is just set, set operations, so I can just replace M with any sigma algebra. If I change the sigma algebra, I should change the adjective here. It will not be Lebel, it will be Borel, it will be whatever you want, it will be your, your self-constructed sigma algebra, but it's still... Uh, so it's just a set operation. I'm not, it's not the measure, it's not anything. Okay, let's do another trivial exercise. Is F monotone measurable or Borel, let's say F monotone increase. From R to R that's not. Is F measurable? I wait 
15 seconds and then please tell me if anybody was not able to prove this existing. F is monotone increasing. Yeah. Strictly, x less than x prime implies f of x. Well, let's add for simplicity this continuum. Doesn't matter. This is just for simplicity, but. It is not important actually. We didn't just get the counter in that. No. Let's, let's, let's see. That was a measurable set. What? It was a measurable set, not a Borat set. We proved yeah. that the E the E. We want to is F Borat or what? Okay, here we imply that it's both that for monotone increasing, but I want just to ask these uh, properties. One of these properties you have to prove. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Yes. Hmm? Yes. Yeah, but wh why? Who has trouble with this exercise? Just need to know after mm -hmm. one chapter what you really understood of the theory or you have some problem. So how many of you doesn't know how to solve this exercise? How many of you knows how to solve this exercise? Let's do that. We are in a measurable set. <laughs> so do the content and the <laughs> count. <laughs> <laughs> so how many of you know how to solve it? One, two, three. At the other they don't know. The intersection is not empty. Obviously, it's not empty. It would be strange. <laughs> Okay, so who wants to die of the people that doesn't know how to do that? Who wants to try? Mm -hmm. But you know, you said you know how to do that. <laughs> this is one of the, of the non empty intersection. <laughs> you don't need to come to that. I just write what you tell me to write. Okay, who wants to try? I I need a suggestion. I'm not doing grades. Well then I take your name. <laughs> take down your name. So, please, who wants to talk? I give suggestions. Okay, if C is increasing, F minus 1 of C plus infinity I'm saying is equal to, because it's continuous, is F minus 1 of C plus infinity Because it's increasing Every point after the counter image of C is larger than C, it cannot be lower, larger than F of C, because it is increasing. <coughs> and if I replace the continuity? Say later. There are continuous up to counter many points. Exactly. 
but it, you don't need it, this one. So let, let, let's let be for, for clauses even better. I state that this is equivalent to that. So the set where f is larger than c contains the interval f minus 1 of c as a set plus infinity. Or it is an interval. Do you agree on that? It's just what is written there. Take a point where it, the value is c. From that point onward, the value is larger than f of c. It's what is written here. You have trouble? And this f minus 1 of c should be a set. But okay. Indeed, uh, there should be a set. I should write a little bit later, but a little bit better. But this is the, the point, no? Then the fact that this is a set doesn't matter. It contains all the points which is equal to C, and then so it could be the union of all X plus infinity. Sorry. With F of X is a greater than C. And that is an integral is equal to the infimum. Okay, well, this depends if it's open or closed. I have to decide, but this is the infimum, and that is in open or closed of the x, so that f of x is equal to c, and then up to plus infinity. But okay, I, I don't want to enter into details, I leave it to you. But the proof is just rewriting this condition into this observation. If I have C here, and this is the counter image, all these points here have a value which is above C. Okay, let, let's end with some other proposition. I, I really want as an exercise this guy. So the definition is that f to the counter image of Borel is Borel, is measurable. So proposition f is, let's say, usually the notation here is L0. So the notation is that, uh, let me write it, write it here f belongs to L0. Lebesgue, 0, you don't require any integrability. Because integrability means that you can give a value to the area below the function. But here you say just that L0 means that okay, the function is meaningful as a Lebesgue measurable. So let me write the notation L0, which is Lebesgue measurable. And then f is equal to g, let back almost everywhere. Then g is measured. This is 1 and 2. f is the back measurable. Then for all d, measurable, f restricted to d and f restricted to r minus d are L0 and vice versa. So let's do the proof and then we end. As an exercise again. So how many, how to know how to prove the first point? Just two or just one? So if two functions coincide up to a set of measures zero and one is measurable, then also the other is measurable. Two? How many knows? Two? 
3. Okay. And one of the other wants to try. I just suggest. Who wants to? I, I suggest, of course. Who wants to help me in that complement set? <laughs> Uh, it's not about just uh, just to help you to get involved into the prudent theory. Uh, because I can go on uh, like uh, well, just read and then go on. Who wants to try? Maybe you have a better idea than the proof that I have in mind. Okay, one in the back side. Please, you. Okay, so. So we know that. Yeah, we have to prove that G is. Okay, so take G of minus or by radius, something like that. This is what we want to prove. Exactly. Okay. So, I mean, if you take G minus of that thing, then it will be... G minus, what do you mean G minus? I mean, C uh, to infinity. Yeah. G minus 1 of C plus infinity is this what we want to prove. Mm -hmm. Now, this is what we want to prove. Now, let, can you rewrite this condition here? So the definition of almost everywhere. Yeah, so I mean the difference between that set and f of minus is, I mean, like a set of measure zero. No? Yes. You know that there exists n, the measure of n equal to zero, and f is equal to g in r minus n. Yeah, true. So finally, f minus 1 of C plus infinity. The symmetric difference with a P minus 1 of C plus infinity is contained in N. Do you agree? And so it has measures in particular it's measured. Perfect. Very well. What about the second? The second is even easier. So I'm saying that so a function is measurable in the whole R so this condition holds and is equal to say, well, if you cut R into two pieces which are measurable, this set uh, in restricted to one piece is measurable and, the other, and this set restricted to the complement piece is measurable and vice versa. So this is uh, how many after this <laughs> stupid explanation know how to and the proof. Mm. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, what is the, the the sigma algebra on uh, defined on G? What is G? Uh, on G, G. Because uh, F restricted to G is uh, that, defined on... That, yeah, I don't need to say this. I, this is F is equal to F in D oh. and zero outside. But really, if you want to, in the way you think, you, I say that the sigma algebra restricted is the intersection of the sigma algebra, which is still a sigma algebra because the intersection commutes. The problem is when D is non-measurable, then that becomes very tricky. Because in that case, what you build is still a sigma algebra, but you cannot state that function which are measurable, that can be extended to measurable function outside. But if this measure, yes. So, okay, this is a digression, a digression with. So, now who's next to prove this guy? This is even easier than the, the first one. You, know, you already have uh, your uh, grade. <laughs> so, who knows how to solve this? Okay, what well, you know, I think uh, you know. Okay, now the one in the middle. It's your turn. <laughs> okay, so let's prove one direction and the other is taken. The other direction is that f is measurable, and I want to prove that if I take any measurable set, f restricted to d, just one is enough, is measurable. So you know what we know. f minus 1, c plus infinity, is measurable. 
and then we know that D is measured. What we have to prove? We have to prove that F restricted to D minus 1 of C plus infinity. And this is what? If C is greater than 0. Yeah. Otherwise, okay, let's see. If, if C is greater than 0, is what? Why? Because we heard. No, because of it. <laughs> so, this function is x if x belongs to D, 0 if x does not belong to D. So, let's compute the inverse. So if C is greater than 0, where is the set where F restricted to D is greater than 0? It cannot be in outside D. Do you agree? It cannot be outside D because it's 0. So it's, it can be in D and actually it's also in the set where F is larger than C. What is the definition of restriction? Because of the yeah, the first one is f of f, not f. Restriction is this one. It's like multiplication. Yeah, f of x, not f. No, f restricted is the no, operation. No, the first. <laughs> okay, so this one is f to the minus 1 of C plus infinity intersection D. And this one? So it is 0. So it is 0. The complement. The complement, so it's D. The complement of D, sorry. So R minus D. Union. Can, can be the points in D, where f is, f is uh, in that interval. So it's uh, f is the same as before. Is that set measurable in both cases? So is this measurable? Because it's sigma. Is this measurable? Because sigma this is measurable and this is measurable. So, OK. And what is the, the opposite direction? Because in the statement, you see, I have also vice versa. Take yeah. the for any d, it is happen. Yeah. Well, I have to use something else, no? For the opposite. Because I have a. Here, you say, I'll prove just one direction. And the other is because the opposite. To come back, I need to know. You see, there is one set which doesn't tell me anything about, well, this doesn't tell me anything about F outside D, because it's just the whole complement. But I can use the second condition to get information outside D. So this piece here in D, and then I have for the second the same piece outside D. And then I can join them. And so, being a sigma algebra is D. Okay, so that's it for today.